Exploration is the domain of smart geos, new technologies, the rethinking of old data, exploring corners of the world which for one reason or, or another have remained untouched. And of course, it is the domain of hunches, gut instincts, passion and for risk taking. To discuss the outlook for exploration, we are joined by the founder and chief investment officer of Commodity Discovery Fund, the only fund uh, focused on discoveries. Uh, his resume says he's based in Amsterdam, but I know he lives on a plane, Mr. Willem Middlecoop. And joining him is a very distinguished member of the Australian mining community who really needs no introduction, a partner of Bailey Holst and the chairman of the Melbourne Mining Club, Richard Morrow. Gentlemen. Thanks very much, Andrew, thank and uh, what a great uh, job you've done today, mate. Th thank you, uh, and, uh, and yesterday as well. Uh, and uh, what a great panel we've just had there. Um, uh, 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 with uh, with Willem and myself, you've only really got the uh, good and the better. The uh, the the, uh, the uh, <laughs> this morning <laughs> had to get that one in. Sorry about that, Headley. But uh, bef but um, look, before we get to uh, uh, Willem, um, for those of you who don't know much about the Melbourne Mining Club, uh, we're a um, uh, got, get great support from uh, miners and uh, explorers. We're a net networking organisation. Um, we're a platform for uh, talking about leadership in the, uh, the mining sector. I'd encourage you to come along um, uh, to any of our events down there in the uh, uh, Australia's mining capital of, uh, of Melbourne. <laughs> oh, that always uh, that always gets a few groans. Yeah. Um, I'm also here with uh, with uh, colleagues John uh, Forward and David Hobday. Um, uh, they're the investment committee from uh, ASX listed Lowell Resources Trust. Um, um, uh, we listed uh, a few months ago, they're sitting up uh, over there. I hope you uh, get a chance to have a word to uh, uh, John and David, especially if you've got a, a bright idea. Um, uh, they're uh, a very experienced team. Um, now, uh, it's my great honour to chat with uh, international commodities expert uh, Willem um, Middlecope uh, today. Uh, just arrived from China, I uh, understand. Uh, uh, well, Willem is, uh, of course, with the Commodity Discovery Fund, Love Discovery. Um, he's a former journalist, TV commentator and author. Eight books in eight languages. Um, the latest being The Tesla Revolution. It's also written a thing called The Big Reset. Certainly well placed to uh, comment on uh, uh, this this segment and this sector, and, and at a very exciting time, Willem. Even an investor in Australia. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, welcome today. First time in Sydney. Yeah, first time. Um, I've been to Perth um, last year. We always concentrated on uh, North America. Uh, I started with discovery investing, as we call it, in um, 2003. Um, I was an early investor, a private investor in, um, I hope this is working because I prepared a few slides. Um, I was a very early private investor in Aurelian Resources and there was a small company doing exploration work in Ecuador and uh, this was really beginner's luck. Uh, I bought 10,000 shares for 30 cents. Uh, at that time I had a newsletter, Middlecope Discovery Alert Service. And um, I tipped to, well, I tipped our subscribers to buy the small company. And then we were so lucky because within six weeks they um, drilled this discovery hole. It was 250 meters, 8 grams, and then they drilled 250 meters, 12 gram, and 250 meters, 24 gram. And this stock jumped from 30 cents to $43 in nine months. <laughs> And later I, 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 I learned about this quote and well, once you've experienced this, you, you'll always be hunting for the next big thing. And the next big thing brought me 10 years later to Australia because uh, we have an amazing discovery uh, in the Pilbara, which is ignored by almost all Australian investors. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> um, well, I'm quite happy they do because we can buy the shares. Um, for almost for free. Um, this discovery is done by um, Novo and Artemis. We, we, we'll, we'll focus on it I think, yes, a little uh, later. Yeah. But um, I'm, I'm always on the hunt for the next big thing. Yes. Well, it certainly uh, uh, you know, had a, a big effect and a big impact uh, both in Canada and in Australia, didn't it? Uh, uh, how did it uh, go from your perspective? 
Um, well, I, I would like to first focus a little bit on the broader market yes. because we have some slides prepared. Um, so, so if if we look at um, if we look at our fund, I'm well known for my market timing. <laughs> we started our fund in 2008. <laughs> when the uh, commodity markets were uh, well, actually perfect on the top. <laughs> uh, but the good thing is, that's, the bad news is the, the, the commodity markets dropped by 60, 70% and are still down by 60% on this index, the CRB index, the broader commodity index. But the good thing is, in our fund, we didn't lose money in the last 10 years. We didn't make money. Well, we had three years in which we made uh, returns of 60, 70, 80 percent in a year, but overall we didn't make money. But we had 45 takeovers in our portfolio, because when you invest in smaller companies, exploration companies, working on the best world uh, world class discoveries, they're always being bought out, and um, I think that's that's also a very safe way to to play this very risky uh, exploration market. And if we look what ha what has happened in the last 10 years, and actually this graph is last almost last 20 years, uh, you see 2008, uh, the Lehman crash, um, everything went down. Um, the purple line is the S&P 500, and the uh, other line, brown line, is the uh, commodity index. Um, we saw a recovery of all markets in 2009, 2010. Um, as a fund, we we did very well. We had 80% uh, return in both. 2009 and 2010, but then something strange happened in 2011, 2012, and I still haven't um, found one analyst, even Barry, our good friend Barry, he's on our technical advisory team since uh, last year. He, he, he hasn't explained this uh, to me, how, how this disconnect could occur, and it, 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 it's an ongoing situation. I think um, commodity markets are bottoming out now, um, and we'll see reversal to the mean, and uh, we'll see the markets coming more together. And, and the undervaluation is incredible in our markets, and the overvaluation in the more general markets is, is, is incredible also. So I, I think it's a great time to invest now. Mm. Yeah, well, interesting. The, the panel just before us were talking about um, uh, Canada being um, in, a, in a slow phase at yeah. the moment, and folks. On, what's happening in Europe? What's their What's their perspective of? Because uh, they're traditionally very, very good investors and very strong investors in the uh, resource space um, uh, on a global basis. Yeah, but in Europe we only focus on the big, the big stuff. You know, we have Royal Dutch Shell in the Netherlands and. Um, that's, of course, that's a big commodity player, a big player in the world of oil and gas. But if you look at um, listed exploration companies in Europe, there are hardly any. There are a few in, um, in London on the AIM, but this is ignored by the mainland Europe. So um, I've been a large promoter in, um, in my own country, in the Netherlands, to um, start looking to North America and to Australian markets, but many retail investors, they simply they can't buy Australian stocks because it's not on their platform. Um, I see many North American retail investors who are very, very interested in the discovery in the Pilbara. Uh, this video was published on YouTube July 12th, it was uh, published by Novo Resources. Um, everybody first thought that there was, there was a trick. <laughs> you can't find nuggets <laughs> just uh, hammering down uh, in the Pilbara that way. But um, many North American retail investors, they want to invest in this story, but they can only buy the North American stocks. And there are two now. There's Novo, you have Pecton. And so um, all Australian um, exploration companies who have great uh, assets in the Pilbara, Artemis, De Grey, DJO, Kairos, um, they don't see any any bits because, and that, that's what surprises me, is the Australian uh, retail market, but especially institutional investors, they are ignoring this um, discovery. And it, it is an amazing discovery. You have uh, conglomerates. Um, I'm not a geologist, but I studied it quite a bit. Um, so you can find conglomerates, um, which are 2.7 billion years old. It's like an old river bedding. And there are nuggets um, um, to be found within the conglomerates. And 
it, it is compared to the, uh, with Waters Rand discovery in the 1880s, and it, it's almost similar. You know, the rocks have the same age, 2.7 billion years old. They're, they're found because they're outcropping, and um, because the conglomerates are quite narrow, uh, the package of the conglomerates, they, they, it's only a few meters. It's, 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 hard to, it's easy to miss them. And they have been missed in the Western Pilbara for the last few hundred years. But they were found in uh, South Africa 150 years ago. And of course, we know half of 40% of all gold produced in the world comes from South Africa. And if, if we study um, the Pilbara, it's the same scale. So on the left side, you see the Pilbara. On the right side, you see the which water end uh, area. And if you compare the size, um, the Pilbara is even larger than the area in which the gold-bearing conglomerates are found, or have been found in uh, South Africa. And be aware, we've been mining these conglomerates in South Africa for the last 140 years, and they're still mining them. And if you want to see the, the amount of ounces they mined it from um, uh, South Africa, you see it in the green. Um, so. In, uh, 275 ounces have been mined from the far west rand, and the average grade was 10.9 grams per ton. And if we look at the Pilbara, the first results, the first samples, they show on average 10, 15, 20 grams per ton. Well, you know, in mining, mm. if you find two, three grams, you're happy. Well, grade is king, isn't it? Uh, um, and uh, these, these. Uh, uh, deposits uh, seem to shine on their faces. Yeah, yeah, but but what surprised me is the skepticism, especially in Australia. Here, you you don't believe in it, you know. And uh, we have all the proof now that this this is a world class discovery. And the only question is, and I've been saying this for the last six, seven, eight months. The only question is, is it a big discovery or is it huge? And everything points that only. On, on the very first spot where the uh, first nuggets were found, Comet Well, Birdie's Reward, which is in the JV between um, uh, Artemis and Nova Resources, you have outcropping conglomerates over at least eight kilometers. There are nuggets everywhere. And the first indications are that um, just the few kilometers there will bring you 10, 20, 30 million ounces of gold. But if you look at this map on the left side, this is a map uh, produced by Quinton Henning, he's the chairman, and the guy who who's always been on the hunt for the gold bearing conglomerates in Pilbara, and I found them. All the dots, the red dots with the blue line, um, they all point to gold bearing conglomerates which have been found which are outcropping in the Pilbara. And from west to east, that's 250 kilometers. From north to south, south, that's 150 kilometers. And yesterday, we had a press release by Myrindi, which owns some ground in the south there, that they are finding fine gold in the conglomerates. And this points to a basin-wide system, just like we have. Um, well, like we have mined in South Africa for the last 150 years. And the total amount of ounces which we've produced from South Africa is, is over 1 billion. Mm. Mm. And the people here in Australia are ignoring the situation. I, I, I can't believe it. Well, it's interesting. Novo has uh, quite a substantial market cap in, uh, uh, in Canada. Yeah. Uh, but look at Artemis. Yeah, uh, well, ex exactly. It's, uh, it's less than 100 million, the enterprise value. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have a bit of a theory that it's uh, the market's at the moment quite immature. And um, I was encouraged to uh, listen to Hen uh, Headley uh, saying that he, you know, he thought we're around about that sort of 8 to 9 o'clock. Uh, so, you know, well, I guess it's still I guess 6 o'clock in, in, in yeah. exploration companies, it's still 6 o'clock. <laughs> I, I guess when, when you, things get perfectly priced, it's, it's generally the top of the market, isn't oh, it? You know, yeah. Well, that's why I'm so happy, because I'm a contrarian investor. I always want to buy when others are selling. And um, if you look at a company like the Grey Mining, they're here. 
I think they have an enterprise value of around 50 million. They have a lithium discovery. They have one million ounces already in an, an older gold project. They have permits to build a plant there. They have an incredible land package. They have gold bearing conglomerates, an enterprise value of 50 million. But look at Artemis. They have the only production plant fully permitted in the Pilbara. They have a nickel discovery. I know the big guys, the Glencores and Ivanhoe's, they're, they're looking at that discovery as we speak. They have a new cobalt discovery. They have a tons of conglomerates. They have the JV with Novo. Actually, they had 4 million shares of Novo. They sold them to Kirkland Lake last week for 20 million. They have 35 million cash. And they're trading next to nothing on, on the A6. And I, I, I can't believe it. And I think in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll see a big, um, well, big news coming from this area. And if you look at this, this picture, these maybe, I don't know if you can see it well, but these are the conglomerates in the with waters rent in South Africa. So the, all the gold which we mined from South Africa, we find this in very small veins. These veins are half a meter, one meter wide. So you see a hand there um, uh, for the comparison. And if, if we look at, at the first samples we got from Novo, um, the yellow um, the yellow uh, area shows you the, the, f the, the, the first one and a half meter of the conglomerates where most of the nuggets um, uh, can be found. And if, if you look at the average um, gold grades, we have five samples there. On average, they grade 35 grams per ton. It's a small area, it's only half a meter, but you can compare to the South African situation because we've been mining there these shallow bands as well. It's interesting, Willem. Um, um, as, as a stockbroker, I tend to focus probably way too short term, but, uh, but also tend to focus on um, on liquidity. And uh, it was, I think, that liquidity, um, money available to to buy shares uh, and, and invest in certain areas of the market, is actually the biggest driver, in my view, of the valuations in, especially the, in, in the exploration sector. Now, if you had to think about where the liquidity is at the moment, it's largely uh, in the hands of uh, existing producers, be it gold, mm -hmm. be it zinc, be it copper. Um, it, it's, that's where the money is. It's sitting, yeah. it's pooling, and it's building up. And I, and I, I feel that it's putting a lot of pressure on, the, on, on um, uh, pr product producing companies to spend that. In, um, in exploration. So I don't think we're too far away f from that. Maybe it's going to happen in M&A. It happens we're when you're at 10 o'clock and yeah. 11 o'clock. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's it. Yeah? That's it. That would, that would back up what uh, Heather was saying about the, uh, the yeah. valuation. It's always the, f the first phase of recovery. The money tends to pour into the larger companies. And then the exploration companies are still struggling to survive. And then later, when the balance sheets of the larger companies, the producers, are really, when they really got cashed up, you see more M&A activity. Um, but the only M&A activity we've seen so far in the Pilbara, you know, it comes from North America. Uh, Eric Sprott, maybe people know his name. He's, he's a Canadian billionaire. Uh, he's the chairman of Kirkland Lake. Um, he personally, together with Kirkland Lake, he invested of the two of them together invested $150 million in this play. And, and I'm surprised that there's not one Australian listed company. We heard the names, the evolutions, so cashed up as well. Why don't you buy a, a first stake in these companies who have this huge land package? Buy the first 10%, do a deal. I think maybe that, that keys into another thing that the panel before was saying is that there's, there's a certain risk aversion amongst the, uh, those bigger companies and that sort of thing. Now, I might just stop yeah. you there because it's, um, it's not <laughs> often we get someone of your experience and, um, uh, and you know, from your perspective uh, to, to Australia. 
Can I call? Is there someone with a question from the audience here who'd like to uh, get a hold of uh, Willem while, um, while we've got him uh, under the spotlight here um, um, on those sorts of areas? Yeah, oh, Kerry in front here. Yeah. Here comes the microphone. I'm glad there's some ladies in the room. <laughs> Good morning. Um, Good morning. Thanks for your comments about the conglomerates in the Pilbara. And, I th and you are saying that people don't believe it. And I think there is a, a, a I guess perhaps um, it comes down to management of the companies. I'm not quite sure. But there, I've been hearing that it's not true. It's not the same as the South African. Um, you're sitting up there saying it is true. It is there. I don't know how you change people's minds. But once people start the rumours, I guess, um, there is a reluctance, especially at the moment, with other um, better plays in the market? Uh, I've heard the same rumours and mm. actually we've heard it, um, we hear it this time and again and, and it is true, it is important that the management team is strong. But there's one play where I don't mind how the quality of the management team is and that's in a world class discovery. If you have a world class discovery, management will always be changed, company will always be bought out. Even the worst management in the world can't kill the best world-class discovery. If you find the next Foise Bay, you know, the drill machine <laughs> will be the truth machine and it will be bought out um, before you can blink, <laughs> blink your eye. And I I if we look at the nuggets being found here, because it it's a good point you make, you know, you want to see proof, you want to see evidence. And, um, can I have the, the picture back on my monitor because it changed to, um, to, to some titles? If you look at the nuggets which, which have been found, these are nuggets from Commodwell and Purdy's reward. But if we look at the nuggets found uh, on the tenements of the grey mining, this is 120 kilometer east. The same nuggets appear in the same kind of conglomerates. And then we go further east, this is also from uh, the greys, this is watermelon seed type nuggets. And then we go east to Haoma Mining, that's 250, 250 kilometers east of Commodwell. We see almost the same kind of watermelon seed nuggets, only a little silver is added here. And that's interesting because in the, with water rent, we find the gold combined with the silver as well. And if we, if we um, look at this press release, which was published by Marindi yesterday. I, I spoke about it a little earlier. We have grab samples returning 20 to 40 grams per ton. And this comes from this fine gold, comes from conglomerates, um, gold bearing conglomerates 150 kilometers south. So, how much more proof do you need? And let's listen to um, Keith Barron. He was the guy who discovered Futal del Norte uh, in Ecuador. He was the guy um, who um, was in charge of the company I first invested on, Aurelian Resources. He was a skeptic, just like you people in Australia. But he traveled there to the Pilbara on his own expenses. And he, 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 he walked the conglomerates. And look at his, what, uh, at his um, statements. He, he posted this on his own blog. Um, eight kilometer strike length tells me this will be huge. Let me make a prediction. The Novo discovery will be the lowest cost gold mine in the industry by a massive margin. Cash cost maybe sub $100. And why are Australian companies ignoring this? And we had, um, I think um, I had another slide. No, sorry, it's not here. But um, uh, uh, with that, I think it also gets back to that, uh, what the panel was saying before about risk aversion and um, so much of the investment sort of mantra we hear for you, or the base or the base of valuation in the Australian market is based on um, uh, jork uh, resor uh, resources mm -hmm. and reserves um, and, uh, and then, you know, how you uh, uh, work up a cash flow model from a, a mining plan yeah. on that. But these things are not amenable to, uh, then that, that, they in the drill bit don't get on together, do they? Look at the yeah. first line, yeah. the Keith, Keith Baron. He yes, states exactly. it may yeah. never yeah. be possible yeah. to get a York compliant reserve number, but it doesn't matter. 
Yeah. Because there's so much gold to be found there. <laughs> you can prove it so easily. But when you're a cash-rich producer like Evolution, what's the risk of taking a 10% stake in a $50 million um, dollars company? Your risk is $5 million. And then you, you can have your uh, own director on the board. <laughs> You, you will be in a front seat, so and, and you will have a first stake into this company. So I, I don't understand why they wait until the North American companies have taken over all of these companies. Because um, I'm hearing uh, rumors that Newman is uh, looking into this situation very seriously. Sumitomo, the Japanese, are looking very serious into this situation. So. It, you know, it's your country, it's your nuggets. <laughs> These are your uh, companies, exploration companies. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting to get your um, outside perspective there. Can I move you on now? We're just uh, in the interest of time. Copper. We had a bit yeah. of a chat um, uh, before. Um, you know, you've, uh, you're very positive in that area, aren't you, with the, uh, as it relates to the electric vehicle uh, revolution? Coming. Yeah, my last book was The Tesla Revolution, mm. and um, I wrote this book um, because I wanted to study the world of energy. Uh, I wrote another book on, on oil and energy 10 years ago, and uh, we learned that there are, well, of course, huge changes coming. Um, so in this whole energy transformation, um, of course, the electric vehicles are the most uh, most dominant uh, um, effect. Um, and and uh, all, we, all, we all speak about uh, the EV revolution now. Um, but as an investor, as a commodity investor, if you study this topic, um, you learn that a few metals will uh, benefit greatly. And of course, everyone's talking about lithium and cobalt, which are um, um, great ways to play this market, although there's no a shortage on lithium worldwide, there's a shortage on production capacity now. So you can play lithium for a few years. Um, there is a real problem in, in cobalt. I think we'll get a huge cobalt squeeze because um, when all prediction on the numbers of EVs which will be produced in the next 20 to 10 to 20 years will come through, uh, we'll see a shortage in cobalt. But it's very interesting to, to look at copper as well. And um, well, th this slide shows how, how deep the, um, the, the um, uh, how deep the correction has, has been on, on commodity markets in the last few years. And we're really um, turning the corner now, I think. And if, if you look at copper, uh, because your, your question was on copper, we need to find one new escondida. Um, we need to find one new large copper mine every 15 months now to be able to supply the market with enough copper in the next 10, 20, 20 30, 40 years. And um, we're big investors in new copper discoveries, and we love the discovery by Sol Gold in Ecuador. Yep. I think it's also Australian yes, yeah. um, connected <laughs> yes. uh, company. Uh, we have a big position, it's one of our largest positions. Sol Gold is, is um, on sale as well. Mm. They had a huge correction, so I think it's a very good buy at this point. But there are very few real good copper discoveries out there. So I think Sol Gold is one of the very few. So as an investor, uh, it's important to focus on copper for the next few uh, decades. And copper is still cheap. And if you listen to uh, Robert Friedland, chairman of Ivanhoe Mines, you know he's a big developer of copper mines. And he always says, well, you will need a telescope to see uh, yeah, the copper right. price in a few years. <laughs> well, he... <laughs> No, no, they, no yeah. exactly. Uh, uh, he's um, uh, a great promoter of, uh, of, yes. uh, of the sector. Yes. And where, where, do you, where do you see uh, any other uh, commodities that uh, you... I mean, uh, energy nickel. was... Nickel, Nic nickel yeah. is very interesting because yeah. we always talk about the, the lithium-ion batteries so for the EV revolution. Um, but because we have the shortages coming in cobalt, um, there are many... Um, uh, studies being done to change the uh, chemical uh, uh, content of the batteries and um, they now produce um, a new kind of battery which has less cobalt and, and a lot more nickel in it and 
I think nickel can benefit greatly uh, of, of this uh, energy revolution. Um, nickel prices are still quite low, so I think nickel is a good um, way to play this as well. Well, we're running out of time here, so uh, just is there one, I see a question up the back there, um, uh, if you could. Thank you. Give us your name and... Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm Srinath. I'm a private investor. Uh, my question um, relates to uranium. Uh, nobody talks about it. Um, is it going to be relevant at all? Uh, will it come back? Yeah. Uh, it is absolutely in the doghouse at the moment. So what's the prospects for uranium? Great, great question. 10% mm -hmm. um, of our fund is in uh, uranium, uh, uranium discoveries. Um, there's one great company out there, Next Gen Energy, Canadian listed. Uh, they are working on an uh, incredible uranium discovery in Saskatchewan. Uh, it will be the second lowest cost uh, gold or uranium mine in the world. Um, they can start producing in five to six years' time. I think uh, they will be bought out as well before they can start producing. Um, because it's an, it's an amazing discovery. It's on sale as well. Um, I know Li Ka-shing, he invested almost 100 million, or over 100 million into next gen energy. His average cost price is $3 per share. It's trading now 230, 240 mm -hmm. Canadian dollars. And I know his target is $10, $10 per share. Li Ka-shing wants to make at least $10 per share on that one. Um, so that's, that's a great way to play uh, uranium markets. And um, to answer your question, um, uh, worldwide we have some 400 nuclear reactors in operation. Um, but in the new world energy mix, where a lot of alternatives are being used, like wind and solar energy, we also need nuclear energy because the CO2 footprint is minimal. And especially in Europe, you have these weeks in, in autumn where there's no wind, there's no sun. You, so you need, you need a backup um, for your energy grid. Yeah. So um, 300 nuclear, new nuclear plants are being uh, produced or planned worldwide, especially in Asia, but also in the Middle East. So there will be um, a large need for uranium um, in the next few decades. And if you study supply and demand on uranium, we'll even have shortages in uranium after 2020. Mm -hmm. So uh, uranium is very cheap now. It has been bottoming out around $15, $20 per pound. That's the spot price. Um, we'll see much higher prices in the future. Well, Willem Middlecope, uh, Commodity Discovery Fund, thank you very much. Put your hands together and uh, uh, thank Willem for his presentation today. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers, mate. Thank you.